good morning. There we go. <laughs> Helps if you remember to turn your own battery pack on a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is so good to see you. I'm Margaret Mitsuyasu, one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Vancouver, Washington. As um, Pastor Josh is on vacation this week. He is traveling with family, and so we will keep him in our prayers and wish him well during this time of rest, a fitting thing for him to be doing on this Sunday. As you shall see later, we are talking about the Sabbath today. Um, a few things in the life of our congregation I'd like to highlight for you. First, um, our next new member class is going to be next week, directly following worship. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about our congregation and how we fit into our denominational structure and the larger Christian tradition, this would be a great opportunity to do that. Um, the class is a part and prerequisite of the, pro of the process for becoming a new member, um, but there is not pressure to do so. So if you just want to learn more, you're welcome to do that. And if you think you would like to officially join our church membership, that is part as well. Um, it will be directly after worship next week, um, and we, lunch will be provided. So if you are planning on attending, if you have not already let Pastor Josh or me know, please make sure to send me an email sometime this week so we can be sure to plan the correct amount of food. So I'm looking forward to that. There are more details about that in the bulletin as well. Um, next, there is a new women's Bible study that is going to be starting up um, at the beginning of November. Um, Nancy Gasson is going to be leading it with the Horizons Bible Study. Um, it will be meeting monthly on the first Fridays, and there are sign-ups, paper, um, paper sign-ups in the Narthex, I believe right now, and there will be online sign-ups as well in about sometime in the next week, so keep an eye out for that, um, and more information on the book and study guide as well. And finally, for the moment, just a reminder that we are in October, which means our Harvest Fest is approaching swiftly. Harvest Fest is one of our fun outdoor community, well, it's a, one of our community events for children. Um, we host it for all of the families and children in our local neighborhood. Um, it's very well attended, and it's lots of fun. Um, it's a primarily a trunk and treat, which we host in our upper parking lot, and so we need people to host trunks. Um, you decorate your trunk, and the kids will go from trunk to trunk, like they're going from house to house trick-or-treating. Um, so that's lots of fun. So mark your calendars. It's going to, we are holding that on Sunday afternoon, um, October 28th, from 4 to 5.30. So if that's something you might be up for doing, um, please check out more information in the bulletin, and let me know um, that you would like to host a trunk. There's a form on our website to let do that. So now let us take a few moments to settle into this time of worship, to collect our minds and hearts, um, to gather in this sacred and holy space. Uh, when I was a kid and I heard the story in Exodus about uh, where uh, God says to Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. You know, he invites them in, and they have the conversation and everything. I thought, oh, I hope that someday I'll be able to go over there and figure out where that happened so that I could experience that. But that was because I was a kid. Uh, as an adult, um, I have had a great number of experiences out in nature where I realized God is in all ground, and all ground is holy. And, uh, and so then I was thinking about uh, when the miracles would take place in the Bible, and, uh, and I thought that, well, those were holy times. Well, the truth is, is that every moment is a holy time. So er, every bit of ground is holy. Every moment is holy. So uh, Pastor Margaret uh, said today's uh, theme at the service is uh, about the Sabbath. And I thought, well, uh, really uh, what the Sabbath is about is recognizing the holy space, the holy ground, 
and the holy time. And one of the ways that uh, we do that, of course, is with music. Uh, it's by loving each other. Um, but uh, throughout history, uh, um, there's been the, uh, the, the act of burning incense to, uh, uh, to make things uh, set apart from the ordinary, to enliven your senses and help you focus on the moment and holiness. And, uh, you know, the, you might remember the wee three kings, you know. Well, they brought frankincense to Jesus as a gift. And frankincense is only grown in one place that I know of in the world. And I have some frankincense today from that place. And, uh, and this goes along with the singing of a psalm. Uh, and the words to the psalm are printed in the back of their uh, last page of your, your uh, bulletin. Blessed are you.
Good morning again. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Our Lord Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We have come, let us receive. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So therefore, let us trust in the unfathomable abundance of God's grace in Christ, and let us offer our prayer of confession, first together in unison, and then in silence. Let us pray. Even with your simplified commandments, O God of love, we manage to get it wrong. We misuse your name on an almost daily basis and dishonor our friends and neighbors by talking behind their backs. We hunger for what others have and think we can put you in a box storing you away on a shelf. We find little enough time for our families, for ourselves, for you, much less setting aside an entire day for that rest you call Sabbath. Forgive us, abiding love. We think we are so wise with the choices we make, only to end up with all that keeps us from you. As we continue our journey of discipleship, may your word fill our speech with grace, with hope, and with peace. And hear now our silent prayers of confession. God of grace and mercy, forgive us and transform us by your love that we may live ever more faithfully for you. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. 
I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. Even now, it is springing forth. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us take a few moments now to share that peace with one another. <laughs> I, I don't have Thank you. All right. Okay, so you know about work, right? Do you do a lot of work? Yeah. Yeah, I think you do. Do you do a lot of work? <laughs> Depends on the day. Okay, yeah, me too. When it's school, yeah. Yep. Now, you, for your work, I've seen you do it. You do, uh, you help mom and dad clean up and you take the dog to the park. You do all kinds of work. But do you like to play? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Do you like to play? Yeah. What kind of play do you like to do? Um, I like to play dinos. Dinos, that's good. How about you? Video games and basketball. Video games and basketball, yeah. Now, have you ever worked and played so much, like all day long? Yeah. Have you ever worked and played so much that you get tired and grumpy? Yeah. <laughs> grumpy monkey. Yeah, you're a grumpy monkey. <laughs> Some, sometimes we actually need to be told to take a rest because when we rest, then we can feel refreshed. There's actually the story of when God made everything and God took every day to make something different animals and people and the world and the sun and the moon and then on the seventh day god said i'm gonna take a rest and the bible yeah and then uh then the bible says that god woke up refreshed just like we do and i think that's in the bible to tell us that rest is important because then when we rest, even when we don't want to rest, when we don't want to take a nap, it's good for us because when we wake up, we can play and work even better. In fact, that's why vacations exist. Yeah, exactly, that's why the vacations were invented. And in our story today, it's actually the law that you have to take a break and you have to rest. You play so much, so it's important to take a rest, right? Sometimes, 
and then you can play some more. That's what it's all about. So can we remember that? No. No? Can we try? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so let's, let's pray together. Thank you, God, for giving us permission and teaching us how to rest. May we work and play so well that afterward we can enjoy feeling refreshed. Amen. Very nice. Absolutely. All right, as we prepare to hear God's word to us in Scripture, let us pray. Lord, open our ears, open our minds, and open our hearts that we might hear and respond to your word. Amen. Our text today starts with Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 through 13. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief, and your homeborn slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. Be attentive to all that I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. And Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 17. The Lord said to Moses, You yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall surely keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the Israelites shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day God rested and was refreshed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the past 17 weeks, we have been making our way through the book of Exodus. We are nearing the end of this journey. After today, we only have two more weeks to go. We're almost there. As we work to interpret and understand scripture, there are a number of things we look to for clues about what the biblical writers thought was most important. One of those things is how much of their text is devoted to a particular topic. This is not the only thing we consider in determining importance, but it is one data point that helps us consider where the authors focus their attention. Applying this strategy to the book of Exodus, we might notice the following. The book spends 14 chapters on the Israelites' experience in Egypt, from their descent into slavery into the, through the departing through the Red Sea five chapters in the wilderness on the way to Mount Sinai. And then the remaining 21 chapters describing the giving of the law and instructions for the tabernacle. More than half the book is devoted to the law and tabernacle. So even though most of our memories and conversations about Exodus, including this sermon series, are about the dramatic events in Egypt, the majority of the book actually focuses on the law. To this day, the Mosaic law is a central and defining element of the Jewish identity. 
Of course, there are endless debates about what that means and how to best interpret and live out the law. For that matter, Christianity itself is a part and product of this debate. Jesus was a Jew, and most of his, ter- most of his teachings were interpretations of the law, and the arguments and conflicts he had with other Jewish leaders were largely over their differing interpretations. A significant portion of all of that debate and a central practice throughout Jewish history focuses on the fourth commandment, the keeping of the Sabbath. The fourth commandment serves as a bridge between the commandments about our relationship with God and those about our relationship with other people. Sabbath keeping is related to both. We honor God with our time and acknowledge several truths about our relationship to the divine. And in the ways in which we do this also shape our relationships with one another and with ourselves, time, and really pretty much the whole created order. For that reason, it is not surprising that the fulfillment of the commandment has received as much attention as it has. Now, before we dive further into this exploration, I have a confession to make. I am no good at this commandment. For example, the irony of working on a sermon about the Sabbath on my day off was not lost on me. I am exceedingly glad that there is no historical evidence that the death penalty that the text prescribes for Sabbath breakers was ever actually implemented. This is not meant to be a humble brag where a person portrays something in a seemingly negative light with the actual intent of cleverly drawing attention to an admirable quality. I am truly expressing my feelings of shortcoming in this area. I usually feel like I am falling behind or I'm on the brink of disaster and have often wondered if maybe I could just focus, sleep, think, or whatever like other people do, maybe then I would be able to get my life together to keep up with everything and feel on top of it. In the meantime, the idea of taking time off often just adds to my sense of overwhelm. If I am already feeling behind, I'll fall even further behind, and I'll definitely never be able to catch up. I usually feel like I do not deserve and have not earned the right to relax or goof off, or at least not to do so guilt-free. The concept of the Sabbath sounds awesome. I would love a true Sabbath. But in one way or another, I inevitably get in my own way. If any of you have ever felt this way too, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the Sabbath is exactly for people like us. The bad news is we are doing it all wrong. Many of the thoughts and feelings I have just described are exactly some of the things the Sabbath is designed to challenge. At its most basic level, The Sabbath helps teach us how to be human. Part of its power is that it doesn't just do this on a head level, it works on a much deeper level, in our hearts and souls, by making its way in through our body as we literally practice its lessons, just like we would a sport or piano or something like that. That's pretty profound and genius all on its own. It also means that we that to truly receive what the Sabbath has to offer, we actually have to do it. We can't just think or talk about it. However, as we try to convince ourselves that we really should actually practice the Sabbath, we'll talk about it a little more anyway, shall we? All right, so the Sabbath helps to teach us how to be human, and I think it does this in at least three ways. The first is that it grounds us in the image of God. Both this morning's text from Exodus 31 and Exodus 20, which we read last week, 
link the Sabbath to God's own rhythm of work and rest in the days of creation. God is clearly underscoring the seriousness of this practice. Essentially, if God thinks rest is important enough for God, how much more important must it be for us as mere creatures? But by referring us back to the creation story, I suspect that God is also reminding us of our creation in God's image. Our need for rest is not just a creaturely weakness. It is also a participation in our unique connection with God. Somehow, our rest is related to God's rest. But all creatures need to rest. So why make such a big deal about it for humans? Why would God invoke the association with creation and God's image just for rest. As I puzzled over this and looked for clues in the text, I came to suspect two reasons. First, rest seems to be a critical element in the creative rhythm. As we observe God's creative process, we might notice that God doesn't just rest on the seventh day. There is actually a daily cycle of work and rest too. After each day's work, there is evening and morning before the next day begins. The number one thing we learn in these opening chapters of the Bible is that God is creative. As those created in God's image, we are designed to be creative too and to participate in God's continuing creative work. Just like God's creative process, ours requires a balanced cycle of work and rest, too. We cannot force ourselves to be endlessly creative. That's just not how it works. Creativity requires energy, joy, and spaciousness, all qualities of life that the Sabbath helps provide and cultivate. Secondly, I think that God values limits. This was a bit of a surprise to me at first. Isn't limitlessness one of the privileges of divinity? Perhaps. But throughout scripture, starting right there in the creation story itself, we see God implementing limits. Not just as a way of restricting our fun, but as a way of establishing the order, stability, and balance needed for all things to flourish. For example, God separates light and darkness, water, air, and land, and creates each animal for their designated habitat. All of these things interact with one another, but they all have their designated place. We also see that God self-limits. For example, by creating us in God's image and inviting us to share in the divine work, God chose to limit God's own work in order to make space for ours. In choosing mercy, God limits God's option for judgment. And of course, in Jesus, we see God choose all the limits of creaturely humanity in order to best love and redeem us. If we are to be human in the way that God intends, we must discern and live with limits too. Certainly, some of our limits are defined for us. We are creaturely beings and only have so much control over the world around us, but it may be a unique human quality and a participation in the divine image that there are also limits that we must choose for ourselves, too. A commitment to practicing the Sabbath helps us to cultivate both the discipline and an appreciation of limits. As we set a limit for work and create space for other ways of being, we experience the wisdom and blessing of balance. And as we learn to practice limits with our time, we will naturally learn to do so in other areas of our lives too. Gradually, we will discover that life is usually better, more productive, more enjoyable, and more sustainable 
when we embrace God's example of balance and order. So as we combine these two together, we see that the first way that the Sabbath teaches us to be human is by grounding us in the image of God as we cultivate the rhythms necessary for creativity and learn the value of limits, both of which we see modeled by God in creation and are critical to the life God intends for us to share. The second way the Sabbath teaches us to be human is by serving as a countercultural corrective. When God first gave the Sabbath to the when God first gave the Sabbath to the Israelites, they had just been newly liberated from Egypt, where they had been slaves for generations. As slaves, they had been forced to work without end, and they had been valued only for their labor. The Sabbath was a practice designed to help them reset their relationship with work. We began talking about the Sabbath as a formation tool a few weeks ago when we explored God's gift of manna in the wilderness. Together, these two practices offered new rhythms for learning a different way to view themselves, work, and God. By collecting manna daily, all that they needed, but no more, they began to reconnect labor with its actual purpose. By resting weekly on the Sabbath, they began to learn that they are not defined only by their work. Humanity is more than labor. Through the combination of both practices, they began to learn that God provides and is trustworthy. They began to learn that God is a God who cares about them and for them, for reasons beyond the work that they do. A God who desires a relationship of love and joy, not a taskmaster looking to find fault or shortcoming. We live in a very different world, and we probably do not have experiences as slaves, but we do live in a capitalist society where, in an interesting, interestingly similar way, values everyone and everything primarily in terms of economic output. We literally assign dollar values to people based on how important we think their work is. Amid our globalist capitalist society, Americans are particularly known for being obsessed with work. In recent years, we have seen this taken to the extreme with a so-called hustle culture, where people feel like they must always be working whether to climb the ladder or prove their worth at a primary job or to supplement their income with secondary endeavors. It has gotten to the point where it seems like no one has hobbies anymore. We've got side hustles instead. All of our efforts have been commodified, monetized, and sold. It's exhausting and unsustainable. And I think it is not surprising that this phenomenon has also been called burnout culture. We could certainly still use the counter-cultural forces of the Sabbath. However, it's really hard to counteract culture. There are real costs to doing so, pun sort of intended. I think it is important to remember that the command to observe the Sabbath was not given to individuals, but to the Israelite community as a whole. While the practice is certainly an important one on an individual level, its real impact emerges from collective practice. If just one of us stands up, or in this case, maybe sits down, and says, this has gotten out of control, it is too much, they're just going to be run over. There are plenty of other people who are still hustling, who will be promoted or hired in their place. And an in and an individual shift in attitude toward work does nothing to address the real problem that for too many, one job really does not sufficiently provide for the needs of a modestly comfortable life. That is a Sabbath problem, too. Our text today tells us that on the seventh day you shall rest so that your ox and your donkey may have relief and your homeborn slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. The Sabbath is not just about 
our rest, but for everyone's rest. Animals, foreigners, everyone and everything who is a part of our society. A Sabbath society properly values work and rest. It honors personhood and creatureliness. It respects limits that promote life, health, enjoyment, and well-being for all. In a Sabbath society, everything, including our own self, is more than a commodity to be exploited and discarded. It all has intrinsic value to be enjoyed, respected, and appreciated for its own self. Work has its place, but it also has its limits. So the second way the Sabbath teaches us to be human is by reshaping our attitudes towards work. And in so doing, it corrects and reshapes our relationships with ourselves, with other people, objects, society, and the world. As a fun side note, I recently finished a lovely book about an unexpected encounter between a robot and human that explores a lot of this. And it's set in a world where people have made some significant progress toward a more balanced society. It is called A Psalm for the Wild Built, and it's by Becky Chambers. So it's not a faith-based book, but it's a fun and thoughtful read. So if you are inclined to check it out, maybe consider visiting the library, which is one of our already functioning sharing economies. The third and final way that I think the Sabbath helps teach us how to be human is by cultivating our ability to receive and appreciate God's good gifts. I am not very good at gifts, giving or receiving. Too often, it feels like there are unspoken expectations or obligations with them, and I prefer more straightforward communication and for everyone to have a choice in the responsibilities they take on. Diana Butler Bass wrote a book titled Grateful, which does a nice job of exploring the many complex complexities of gifts and gratitude, and I was relieved to discover that I'm not the only one who has ever felt this way when I came across it. I think one of our study groups here might have read it a few years ago, too. Gifts can be complicated, but gifts truly given from the heart for the simple purpose of mutual enjoyment and with no expectation beyond the hope that the recipient will be happy, those are delightful. I think the Sabbath was meant to be a gift like that. Because the Sabbath comes to us in the form of a commandment, I think most of us are predisposed to approach it with a reluctant, take your medicine kind of attitude. Certainly, there have been many in both the Jewish and Christian histories of the practice who have legitimately contributed to that view of the experience. But the Sabbath was not meant to be a boring obligation. If we consider all that we have discussed so far today, along with the purposes named in the text themselves, I think we will discover that the Sabbath is actually a joyful gift intended for delight. Exodus 23 told us that the purpose of the Sabbath is to rest, find relief, and be refreshed. Tell me, when was the last time that you felt refreshed by dutifully soldiering through an obligation or by enduring an extended session of boredom? Never? That's what I thought. So the Sabbath might be a commandment, but I wonder if the command was actually offered to ensure permission. At the beginning of the sermon, I shared that I often do not feel like I have earned or deserve a Sabbath, but that is precisely not the point. That is exactly the perspective the Sabbath is designed to destroy. The Sabbath works to decouple our worth from our work. We are allowed to be, just because. This is really hard for us, and we are obviously very good at finding ways to disqualify ourselves from this blessing. So part of me wonders if God made the Sabbath a commandment in order to help us overcome 
our own self-critical hesitations and just accept the gift that God wants to offer us. The Sabbath is a gift, a gift that God wants us to enjoy. As Jesus put it in John 10, he came that we might have life, and life to the full. Life includes work, but life is also more than work. And the Sabbath helps us to claim this reality. The Sabbath is an opportunity to relax, to sleep, to spend time with friends and family, to eat good food together, to play with kids, grandkids, and pets, to take naps, to read books for fun, to go for a walk, play games, to do things just because, to just be, to actually appreciate and enjoy the life that we have been given. The Sabbath should not be boring or an obligation. And if we are doing boring or obligatory things, I doubt that we are practicing the Sabbath. But neither does the Sabbath need to be an epic adventure, masterfully chronicled for Instagram at that. The Sabbath is for tending to whatever will most contribute to your fullest experience of life. So what does this all look like? How do we actually do this? Sorry to disappoint you, but I really don't know. Remember how I said at the beginning that I'm not good at this. I am very much in the process of working this out for myself, too. But I suspect that to start, we're going to need to at least make a greater effort to carve out some intentional time for rest, relaxation, and joy. Even if it's not a whole day, it's important to start somewhere and to work at making it a habit. After all, part of the Sabbath's power is in its regular rhythm of shifting between our various ways of being and correcting our relationships, particularly with work. The hard part is that this is going to require us to make choices. We're going to have to actually set priorities and choose not to do some things, even some good things, perhaps even some important things. We're going to have to learn how to say no. No is a Sabbath word. We're probably going to disappoint some people along the way. I hate all of those things. I want to do everything. I want to do it well, and I don't like disappointing people. But limits are a part of God's design. There is a limit on what is possible. There is only so much time in a day, only so many hours in a week. So if we are to honor the rhythms of work and rest, both daily and weekly, this is going to be a part of the process. Practicing the Sabbath will be a challenge. It will take some time and adjustments to make it a regular part of our lives. But that is part of the process. And I suspect that it will indeed be worth it. So come, let us keep the Sabbath. Let us set this time apart and designate it for this holy purpose. Let us honor this invitation to be truly human. And let us accept this loving and joyful gift of rest, refreshment, and renewal. Amen. If you are able, please stand and together we will read today's affirmation of faith. We declare Christ has freed us from trying to save ourselves by obeying the law. He restores us to God's law as a gift and delight. The law describes concretely the shape of our freedom. When we accept its discipline, it keeps our personal lives from being chaotic and increases our effectiveness in the church's mission. We believe Christ gives us and demands of us 
personal lives that are centered in God and open to God's reality and rule. Christ teaches us to put obedience to God above the interest of self, family, race, or nation, to offer God joyously our money, ability, and time. It is part of our discipline to observe a day of worship and rest, setting aside our own working to enjoy God's work, celebrating with spiritual siblings the Lord's goodness. We need to search out God's way in scripture constantly, not expecting detailed directions for every decision, but relying on the word to tell us who God is, to press God's present claim on us, and to assure us of God's grace and comfort. We are charged to pray for ourselves and others with gratitude, boldness, and persistence, confident that God hears and answers our prayers in ways best for us all. Life in God's presence ushers in life for others, for if we do not love siblings whom we see, we cannot love God whom we do not see.
Five years ago, Carol Doan, one of our church members, started the nonprofit Woman of Wonder, which provides scholarships to women from Washington State. And our mission ministry is pleased to be able to su support this worthy cause. The first year scholarships were granted, the first year scholarships were granted to a young member of our church, and she um, was awarded scholarships in subsequent years as she completed her studies. And this year, she graduated with her nursing degree. And she is one of many who have benefited from this worthy cause. Oh, by the way, it is called Woman of Wonder. Woman is singular because Carol wanted the scholarship winners to be able to stand up and say, I am a woman of wonder. So today, Carol wants to share about a special fund founded by another of our church members. Carol. Good morning. When we meet here on Sunday and greet the people that we're sitting next to, there's so much about their lives that we are not aware of. The hurts from their past, the safety they may not have felt as children, and the comfort they may ne never have received from their parents. Some have even experienced domestic violence. As children, one of our church members and her sibling experienced domestic violence. As grown-ups, they decided to take action. They asked each other, what's one small thing we can do just to make the world a better place? They started a conversation with us at Woman of Wonder, and they asked if they could create a scholarship for someone else who had experienced domestic violence. I said, for sure, we can do that. It's called a restricted fund. You would just donate to it, and we would keep those funds set aside until somebody um, volunteered that they had experienced domestic violence. And I have to tell you, so far, in the five years that we've been doing this, no one has. But we decided to move forward anyway. They donated, the two sisters donated, their mom donated, and in May, we started reading scholarship applications. Michelle, a single mom and future nurse, shared with us as part of her application, I am also a survivor of domestic violence. First time in five years, someone shared that. She went on to say that three years ago, my former boyfriend nearly strangled me to death. As we continued to read Michelle's application, we knew we'd found our sister's fund scholar. We were short the full amount for a scholarship on that year, this year, so two board members chipped in so that we could grant Michelle a full $1,000 scholarship. Today, I wanted to introduce you to the sister's fund and invite you to also help with this fund. Um, if you would like to make a tax-deductible donation, you can do it here at the church. Um, you can mail it to the church. We also have a mailbox inside the church office across from the Xerox machine. And it would be a great benefit to be able to support Michelle through um, all the years that she has left to graduate. And as I mentioned, she's studying to be a nurse, so she really has a heart to serve others. I think that together, when we do things like this, when we support people who are trying to make a difference in their lives and the lives of other people, we provide a balm for the hurts that we know of and the hurts we may never know. Thank you for considering Woman of Wonder and donating to the Sisters Fund. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. As we turn to God in prayer, today's prayer is a responsive one. So as I conclude each section with come Holy Spirit, you are invited to respond, fill the earth. So come Holy Spirit, fill the earth. Let us pray. Holy One, spark of light. Creation was envisioned by you and is sustained by you. In gratitude, we pray for the world, that its riches and resources be used responsibly and fairly, that its rulers and leaders may govern with justice 
compassion, and humility, and that humankind may live with understanding and respect, noticing what unites us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the earth. Holy One, prophet of love, you lived among us to teach us, to show us how to love. In humility, we pray for siblings around the globe. For those dehumanized by their struggle for existence, may we listen. For those overshadowed by the constancy of death, may we notice. For those besieged by fear, anger, and relentless peril, may we show up. For those ensnared by systems beyond their control, may we demand change. Today, we also pray for Ukraine, South Sudan, Israel and the Palestinian territories, and Afghanistan. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the earth. Holy One, heart of caring, you met each person you meet encountered in the midst of their own concerns. With love, we pray for ourselves and those known to us, including Jan Panair, Mike Gaston, Bill Maltby, Bill and Mary Lou Mullen, Colleen Otten, Wes Rainey, Doug Van Ness, and Dan Wilson. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the earth. Holy One, breath of being, you are here in this very moment as a constant presence and insistent voice. In gratitude, we pray. With boldness, we pray. Inundate the world with humanity. Overwhelm the world with truth. Flood the world with kindness. Upset our indifference. Accelerate our action. Fortify our resolve. And compel us to authentic discipleship that nurtures creation, embodies love, and breathes life. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the earth. And now, with the confidence of your children, we pray the prayer that Christ taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Over the past several weeks, we have been hearing moments for ministry from each of our session ministries. Um, and today we are continuing that, and we're going to be hearing from the Congregational Life Team um, from Elder Mary Pierce. Welcome, Mary. Good morning. I wonder if we can think for a minute about why we all come to church. Most of us can say we come to worship God, which is good. It's what we're supposed to do. It's the primary reason we're here. But how many of you are completely fulfilled when you come to church, come to worship, and then go home? Does that fill you completely? For some, it does. For others, it doesn't. Some of us come to church and leave and feel lonely and feel as though it didn't matter that we were there, nobody really noticed, nobody really cared. I've talked to people at our Saturday breakfast who have been attending the same church for years and don't feel they really are a part of that church. Part of the reason that that happens is a lack of connection. 
and what congregational life tries to do is provide opportunities for connection. Opportunities for you as a congregation to meet each other in a non-stressed way, in a non-work way, in shared interests, in shared opportunities to serve, working alongside each other on projects or in events or activities that you all seem to have an interest in and enjoy. And by doing that, by participating in those opportunities and those activities and events, we create connection. We get to know each other. And we start to become and feel like a family. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to draw from each other. He wants us to learn from each other. He wants us to grow together, to rejoice together, to mourn together, but to stay in communication, to understand that the, the chore of being a Christian, and it's sometimes hard to do that, is not meant to be lonely. It's meant to be shared. So how do we do that as congregational life? We try to provide opportunities and activities and events that allow you to fellowship, that allow you to connect, that allow you to get to know each other and to grow in your relationships. There are lots of ways for you to participate. I've enjoyed being a greeter from the time I first started doing it because it gives me an opportunity to get to know people, to recognize how they are and who they are. And it's simple. I just have to stand there and say good morning. You should try it. It's really fun. We also have, you know, provide coffee hour after church. And thanks to some very faithful servants, Yusnita and Marilyn and Murray, that coffee hour provides a fellowship opportunity. And I love it that people come and have a little snack and some coffee and sit down and just visit with each other. It's an opportunity to be part of that relaxation that Sabbath is meant to be, to enjoy each other, to rejoice in those relationships, to learn more about each other. We provide kickoff Sunday to kind of get us rolling in the fall. Who doesn't like hot dogs and corn, for crying out loud? <laughs> not to mention ice cream. We also have other things. For folks that are not so mobile or maybe can't get to church, we have a 5 o'clock social by Zoom on Thursdays. We also have a virtual coffee hour for, for folks that are participating in worship via YouTube. So those opportunities are there for them to connect as well. We have the potlucks. We've been told you like those. We kind of gathered that because we have good turnout and people have fun. And they're not expected to do anything but eat. How easy is that? We also help with receptions for memorials or for special events. And it's another opportunity for us to get to know people, to support people, to be engaged with the congregation. And we've recently started Breakfast with Your Neighbors, the Saturday morning breakfast. I have gotten to know so many of you so much better, and it's a thrill to have that opportunity. We're having fun in that kitchen, putting food together and serving folks. You should try it. These are all opportunities for you that the Congregational Life Team is hoping will help you find ways to connect with each other. And if you would like to be part of us, we'd, we'd love to have you. But more than that, we want you to take these opportunities. We want you to look for ways to plug in, to connect, to get to know each other, to strengthen our bonds. And thank you for giving me a minute to talk to you about that.
Thank you, Mary. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Let us offer our gifts and ourselves to God in thanksgiving. There are many ways that you can share our gifts. Please check out the bulletin or talk to one of our elders to learn more about the volunteer opportunities we have to offer. You can make a financial gift. You can place them in the box as you exit the sanctuary. You can mail or bring them to the church Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, or you may give online at vanfpc.church giving. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have filled our cups to overflowing. We have enough, more than enough. Receive our offerings as signs of our thanksgiving and use them so that all people might have enough and give you praise. Amen. Receive the gift of the Sabbath. May you nurture your connection with the goodness of life. May you find balance in your rhythms of work and play. And may you experience the freedom of God's rest. And as you do this, may the creativity of God's creation, the freedom of Christ's grace, and the energy of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.